the author said, proof from the hadith that refutes the Wahhabi creed. So we went over proof from the Quran last time. We talked about the ayah, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ in detail. Now we want to go over evidence from the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Question, do you have a hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? The answer is yes. As for the honorable sayings of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, we recite the hadith, كان الله ولم يكن شيء غيره. Allah existed eternally and there was nothing other than Him. Not only is this an extremely basic and easy to understand proof, but it is exceedingly strong evidence against them. You would find Wahhabis quoting the ayah of the Quran, Laysa kamithlihi shay. This hadith is so strong that you will not find them quoting this hadith. Although it's authentic, narrated by Al Bukhari, and it's a hadith directly related to the belief, but they don't quote it, they don't have anything to do with this hadith. Whenever they discuss the attributes of Allah, they have nothing to do with this hadith. It shows that Allah was eternally alone. With no beginning, he was alone. There was no arsh, sky, body, place, direction, light, darkness, nor anything else. Question, how do you use this hadith to refute them? If a Wahhabi insists on his bad belief, mention this hadith and then ask, but without the intention to make him say blasphemy, is a place something other than Allah? Which is the hadith. The hadith is, and memorize this hadith, brothers and sisters, even if you memorize it in English. Can Allahu walam yakun shay'un ghayru? Very easy hadith. Can Allahu walam yakun shay'un ghayru? Can Allahu walam yakun shay'un ghayru? Memorize that hadith if you haven't memorized it. If you haven't memorized it, Take that sentence there, and you have it memorized by tomorrow. Shouldn't even take you that long to memorize that hadith. Now, in English, you can say, Allah was, and there was nothing other than him. Allah was, and there was nothing other than him. That's the hadith. Or you can say, Allah existed, and there was nothing other than him existing. Or you can say, Allah existed in eternity, and there was nothing other than him existing in eternity. But if you just want to memorize it by its bare literal meaning, Allah was, can Allahu, Allah was, walam yakun shay'un ghayruh. And there was not anything other than him. And there was nothing other than him. So if a Wahhabi insists on his bad belief, mention this hadith, and then ask, but without the intention to make him say blasphemy. So our question is not to um, lead him into blasphemy. Rather, our intention really is to make him understand and accept the truth. We correct our intention. We want to help this person to believe properly. So the question is, is a place something other than Allah? Can Allah walam yakun shay'un ghayruh? Allah existed and there was nothing other than Him existing. Is the place something other than Allah? He can give three possible responses. One, He will most likely ignore your question entirely. 
and instead of answering, he would ask you a different question, or he may change the subject. If he does either of those, do not answer his question, nor follow him into another subject. Stick to the hadith and do not let him get away with not answering the question. You have tunnel vision. When you're involved in these debates, you ask a question and you want an answer for that question. So you ask him, and no matter what he says, if it's not the answer to the question, you do not move forward. So he will most likely ignore your question entirely, and instead of answering, he would ask you a different question. That's a common uh, way of evading a question in a debate or in other than a debate in some form of interrogation or whatever. You ask a person a question and then he just asks you a question. So if it were me, if I asked a person a question and then he asked me a question, I would say to him, I asked you first. They'll say, well, I asked you second. So then I would say, so since I asked you first, you answer me first. And, and since you asked me second, I will answer you second. So I asked you a question. What's the answer? So if he does either of those, he ignores you or he changes the subject. Yani he, he asks you a different question. Do not answer his question. Whatever was that new question he asked you, don't answer it nor follow him into another subject. Whatever issue he brought up, don't follow him into that issue. Stick to the hadith and do not let him get away with not answering the question. Is a place something other than Allah? Even if you have to repeat it again and again, and even if he gets mad that you are repeating the question, is a place something other than Allah? If he refuses to answer the question, it is because he actually understands but he is stubborn on his misguidance, and he does not want to be cornered. For the dishonest person cares about winning a debate, not about conforming to the truth. Two, if he says that the place is Allah, which we do not expect him to say, so when we asked him, we didn't expect him to say this answer, then he is an idiot, and a clown, and a donkey, who committed pure, explicit, and blatant blasphemy. Most likely, he will never say that. He won't say, yes, Allah is the place. They don't believe like that. Three, if he says that the place is something other than Allah, then say, the Prophet wasallam said that Allah existed without anything, and you agree that the place is something other than him, so by this hadith, Allah existed without a place. If the Wahhabi says, well, Allah is now in a place, then he likened Allah to the creations, attributing change to him. Places are not eternal because Allah is the only eternal one. And soon we will see that the scholars of the Salaf denied that Allah changes. Therefore, the scholar said that if someone says that Allah is in a place, he is either saying that Allah is created or that the place is eternal. If someone says Allah is in a place, then he is either saying that Allah is created or that the place is eternal. They also said that if someone says that God is a body, then he is either saying that God is a creation or that bodies are eternal. Eternal here means with no beginning. They also said that those who attribute a body to God have left no way to prove that the world is a creation. We spoke about that before in previous lessons. The meaning of that is that the one who believes that Allah is over the throne, for example. If it were said to him, how do you prove that the world is created? He might say, well, Allah says in the Quran, وَخَلَقَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ 
He created everything. So then we need to refine the question and say, no, what I'm asking you is actually, how would you explain it to a person who doesn't believe in the Quran? How would you rationally just explain to a person that everything is created, all the things around us are created, and they need a creator? How would you explain that? No matter what he says, whatever he says to prove that the world is created, that's what he's going to be saying about what he worships. Because he believes that God is in a place that would mean that he believes that God is a body. So whatever he says to prove that the world is created applies to what he worships. So that's three things there. What did they say? They said, whoever says that Allah is in a place, he is either saying that Allah has created or that the place is eternal. That's one. They also said that if someone says that God is a body, then he is either saying that God is a creation or that bodies are eternal. That's two. And they also said that those who attribute a body to God have left no way to prove that the world is a creation. How's the voice? How's the voice? Good voice? Okay. Alhamdulillah. Extra detail. The shirk of Ibn Taymiyyah. Now, I might need you, not I might, I need you to put on your thinking caps, brothers and sisters, for this one. Okay? Some of you are already familiar with this. And some of you, this might be the first time you've ever heard some talk about what we're going to say now. So if you're not familiar with what we're going to mention now, then you need to concentrate and focus with me. To give you a quick background, we're talking about something being created or not created. If something exists, then it either exists with a beginning or without a beginning. There's no third option. If it has a beginning, if it exists and it has a beginning, then that means it's created. It's not eternal without a beginning. If it exists but it's not created, that means it's eternal. It does not have a beginning. Otherwise, it doesn't exist. Because of the clarity of this refutation, from this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ibn Taymiyyah went to claim the existence of the types of things eternally with Allah. The types of things. There should be an underline there. The types of things. Not the things themselves, their types or their kinds. This means that he does not confirm that a thing itself is beginningless. No, the thing itself has a beginning according to him. But that its kind or type is beginningless. Like this cup I have in my hand. This is a thing itself. According to him, it has a beginning. But the kind of thing it is, which is a cup, that's the kind of thing. According to him, before this cup, there were other cups. And before those cups, there were other cups. And before those cups, there were other cups forever into the past. And so it's the kind of thing that has no beginning, not the thing itself. For example, he would say that every book is created, but the book as a kind of thing is not created. Created. And every man is created, but mankind is not created. Uh, that's a heavy claim there, right? That's some heavy stuff, because that's blasphemy. That's clear blasphemy. That's shirk. So, for sure, then, we claiming that Ibn Taymiyyah said that, we need to bring our references. He said in his book, Minhaj al-Sunnati nabawiyyah Wa in jaza an yakuna naw'u al-hawadithi da'iman lam yazal. فَإِنَّ الْأَزَلَ لَيْسَ هُوَ عِبَارَةً عَنْ شَيْءٍ مُحَدَّدٍ بَلْ مَا مِنْ وَقْتٍ يُقَدَّرُ إِلَّا وَقَبْلَهُ وَقْتٌ آخَرٌ That's his exact verbatim quote. 
he said, even though it is valid that the creations in their kind would be everlasting and beginningless, that is the underlying part. He said, وَإِن جَازَ أَنْ يَكُونَ نَوْعُ الْحَوَادِثِ دَائِمًا لَمْ يَزَلْ لَمْ يَزَلْ Never ceasing to be, having always existed. He said, even though it is valid that the creations and yakuna نَوْعُ الْحَوَادِثِ the creations in their kind, the kind of the created things, that they would be everlasting and beginningless. He said, for eternity is not an expression of something specific. فَإِنَّ الْأَزَلَ لَيْسَ هُوَ عِبَارَةً عَنْ شَيْءٍ محدد. It's not an expression of something specific or something with some sort of um, discernible limit. Instead, he said, there is no moment of time except that before it, there was another moment. So what he's saying is, this moment of time we exist in, before it, there was another moment. And before that one, there was another. And before that one, there was another. And like that, forever into the past. So it's not impossible that the kind of the creation would be eternal. That's what Ibn Taymiyyah said. That's blasphemy. Does not Ibn Taymiyyah know that time is a creation of Allah and hence was preceded by non-existence is as if he's saying time is not even created itself. He's saying there is no time except that before it there was another time as if he's saying time is not created. Doesn't he know that Allah created time we say there is a moment that before it there was no moment we don't agree with that he said bal ma min waqtin yuqaddar illa wa qablahu waqtun akhar he said instead there is no moment of time that can be measured except that before it there was another moment we don't agree with that we say there is actually a moment in time that before it, there was no other moment because there was no time Allah hadn't created it. So doesn't Ibn Taymiyyah know that time is a creation of Allah and hence was preceded by non-existence? That's what happens to you when you liken Allah to the creation. You say weird things like that. And then you try to rationalize it. That's why the Christians, sometimes they don't even bother. They don't try to even go that far. They say, listen, don't even ask any questions about it. This is what we believe. Ibn Taymiyyah tried to make sense out of something that doesn't make sense. And so he wound up saying something twisted like this. If that expression is not clear enough, that one we just read about him, then here is his statement from his book called Muafaqatu Sahihi al Manqul li Sahihi al Ma'qul. He said, Fa inna al Azaliya huwa nawu al Hadith, la ainu al Hadith. He said, because the eternal one is the type of the creation, not the created thing itself. So that's Ibn Taymiyyah's conviction. That wasn't the first one we read. That wasn't a slip of his pen. That wasn't a perversion inserted by someone who typed up his manuscripts and added that statement. Rather, he has statements like this spread throughout his books. These are only two statements here. He has more. He said it over and over and over in different ways. What led Ibn Taymiyyah to say these things is the fact that he wants to confirm a place and a direction for Allah, no matter the cost. Thus, if it were said that attributing a place to Allah means that Allah changed, meaning if it were said to him, hey, Ibn Taymiyyah, hold on a second. You said Allah has over the throne, but don't you know that Allah has no beginning? He should say, yes, Allah has no beginning. He said, well, don't you know that the Arsh is a creation of Allah? He would respond by saying, well, no, actually, the place as a type of thing is beginningless. So Allah was always in a place. 
Before that place, there was another place. And before that place, there was another place. That's how he tried to rationalize likening Allah to the creations. His sticking to saying that Allah is a body, whether directly or indirectly, but that's what he's saying, that Allah is a body, and his being um, determined about that, no matter what, everything else has to bend around that, it made him say these absurd sayings. Or he would say, Allah was always over the Arsh. Because before this Arsh, there was one before it. And before that one, there was one before it. Etc. And what he really, really, really means, according to what we learned, what we heard from some of our sheikhs, that he's just he's saying it's eternal. Because what he's really saying what he really wants to say is, when he says, before that Arsh there was another one, and before that Arsh there was another one, he wants to say that this Arsh is always going in and out of existence. Like, take the phone that you're using for listening to this lesson, or whatever laptop or device you might be using to listen to this lesson. It's like he's saying, that device you're using, it's not the same device you had a moment ago. It went out of existence and came back. And that moment before that, it wasn't the same. It was a different one before that. And the moment before that, it was a different one. And he took that from philosophy. That's blasphemy. This creed of Ibn Taymiyyah is a shameful exposure and a confirmation of his belief that something existed with Allah eternally, which is shirk. Types do not exist without their individual elements. Yani, let's refute this further. What's the argument, the definitive argument? What's the attack? How do we target this fallacy? By saying that it is unsound to say that the thing itself is created, but its type is eternal. Because types don't exist without their individual elements. If it were said, for example, that there is no shoe in the room, that means that the entire type does not exist in the room. The entire type doesn't exist in the room. Because none of its individual elements are existing in the room. If, for example, there were no humans, then mankind does not exist. So claiming that the kind is eternal is a claim that the elements are eternal. And thus he has contradicted the verse of the Qur'an, Huwal awwal, which means he is the first, meaning the only one who exists without a beginning. Allah. Allah is the only one who exists without a beginning. Also, the Wahhabis believe that Allah moves from one place to another. But motion is not eternal. It comes into existence, meaning it has a beginning. After it was non-existent. Non-existence does not apply to Allah. And non-existence does not apply to any of the attributes of Allah. So Allah would not come into existence after he wasn't existing. And none of his attributes would come into existence after it wasn't existing. So how can the Wahhabis confirm that Allah literally descends and ascends... When the Prophet ﷺ told us that Allah is eternal. Can Allah walam yakun shay'un ghayruh? Allah existed and there was nothing other than him. They don't understand this hadith. They don't see how what they are saying contradicts this hadith. Because they didn't even know what being eternal means. They didn't know how to be consistent. And say, God has no beginning, his attributes have no beginning, therefore anything that has a beginning is not God or an attribute of God. So according to them, he has no beginning, and he goes up and down in the sky. According to them, he has no beginning, he existed before the creations even existed, but after he created the creation, he became above the creation. That's impossible. And then not just that, he became above the creation. Then he actually mixed with the creation and blended with the creation because according to them, he came down to the sky. 
So he's coming down from over the Arsh. Then he goes down below the Arsh, below the seventh sky, below the sixth sky, below the fifth sky, below the fourth sky, below the third sky. Going down, down, down. And to them, that's all eternal, not created. Just because they have kufis and beards and Arabic names, that doesn't make them Muslims. That's blasphemy. Believing like that is blasphemy. According to the Wahhabis, Allah acquired attributes, which negates being eternal. How is it known that we are created and not eternal? It is because we change and develop. Changing and developing are signs of the existence of the mighty creator, the Lord who creates and gives us the attributes that we did not have before. We are the ones who have attributes that come into existence. We have a beginning. We came out as babies. And we didn't have any knowledge and we were weak. We couldn't talk, we couldn't walk. And then Allah gave us new attributes. He gave us strength, he gave us size, he gave us knowledge, etc. Changing and developing are signs of the existence of the mighty creator. The Lord who creates and gives us the attributes that we did not have before. This is why Abu Hanifa said in Al-Fiqhul Akbar, At-Taghayru wal ikhtilafu yahdufu ind al-makhluqin. Changes and variations occur to the creations. Only. That's the implication. He's saying only. He's saying change and variation, that's for the create, created things. Allah is not a creation, so no one gives him attributes. Ahlu Sunnah agreed that he does not give himself attributes because whatever Allah creates is a creation and he does not have a created attribute. Allah is not like us. He is the one who changes things, but he does not change. He is eternal. This hadith is also an explicit one whose meaning cannot be played with. Use it against them and stick to it. Do not let them lead you away from it as the more devious among them may intentionally try. If you use it properly, there would be no way around it. This hadith is so strong against the Wahhabis that you can afford to start your argument with it. You can dominate in the debate with a Wahhabi by using this hadith faster than by using the ayah laysa kamithlihi shayt. Because the ayah laysa kamithlihi shayt, which means nothing is like him, they quote that ayah and they misunderstand it and misinterpret it and so you can bring the ayah, but you're going to argue back and forth with him about what it means to say that he's not like anything. So if you want to really get to the point and squash it quickly, which you should want to do, start with the hadith right away. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, كَانَ Allahu وَلَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْءٌ غَيْرُهُ Once the sister called me up, she was talking to a Wahhabi. She said, talk to this Wahhabi for me. So I talked to him on the phone. And I told him the hadith. So this ignorant Wahhabi, he said, don't come with these weak hadiths. So first of all, he didn't know the hadith. Because they don't teach this hadith. Second of all, he spoke without knowledge. And he claimed that the hadith was weak. He didn't fear Allah because he dared to assume without knowledge, without even knowing the hadith, that it was weak. And he's not the only one I heard say that about this hadith. So I told him, you can't say the hadith is weak when you don't know. This hadith is narrated by al-Bukhari. So he didn't have anything to say. He just, he stopped talking. He literally stopped talking and gave the phone back to the sister. Scholarly texts refuting the Wahhabi creed. Question, what did the scholars say? Well, we don't necessarily need that question here because we've been quoting the scholars since we started many, many pages ago. But 
just for good measure because we're following a process here. So we refuted them mentally. We went through the mental references. Then after we refuted them mentally, we took to refuting them textually using the religious documents, which we have several, right? We have Quran, we have Sunnah, we have the statements of the scholars. As for the Quran, we went over that. And we talked about Laysa Kamithlihi Shay in detail, as well as other verses of the Quran we mentioned to support what we were saying about Laysa Kamithlihi Shay. Nothing is like him in any way. So that's one type of text. We used it. Now we moved on from there and we brought another type of text, which is a hadith of the Prophet. And we have more to go, but notice here what we're doing. One ayah, we focused on one ayah, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ Even though we mentioned others, فَلَا تَضْرِبُوا لِلَّهِ الْأَمْثَالِ Do not make examples for Allah. وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ There was never anything like him. هَلْ تَعْلَمُ لَهُ ثَمِيَّةٍ Do you know about someone like him? And other verses. But we focused on one ayah. Same thing for the hadith. There are plenty of hadiths we can use against them. But just take this one and focus on it. It's all you need. Can Allahu walam yakun shay'un ghayruh. Now, of course, we're going to go over more, inshallah. Question Can you go over how to prove that the hadith is sahih? What if they say not every hadith in Bukhari is sahih? Oh, that's easy. Yeah, it's true. Not every hadith in Bukhari is sahih. Yeah, but the scholars spoke about those hadiths. So you just want to mention a fun fact? That's all he's doing by saying that. Here's a fun trivia fact. Not every hadith in Bukhari is sahih. Oh, yeah, that's true. A, a, a small handful of hadiths in Bukhari are not sahih. Is this one of them? No. Well, don't try to slip that past me. Yeah, he will try to slip something like that past you. That's true. That's a good question. I say, oh, not every hadith in Bukhari is sahih. He's only going to say that, though, when you are crushing him. Because when it works to his benefit, when he brings the hadith of the slave girl, he's going to tell you, this is narrated by Muslim. And this hadith is sahih. Put it this way. Easy way to talk about that. You don't have to prove that each hadith in Bukhari, one by one, is sahih. Because the scholars already said that the hadiths of Bukhari are sahih. In this case, it's the other way. If you want to say that a hadith in Bukhari is not sahih, then you need to bring the references for that. So let's see who said so. Ibn Taymiyyah didn't say so. So we mentioned mental evidence. We finished with that. Then we started with the textual evidence. We mentioned an ayah from the Quran. We finished with that. Then we mentioned a hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We have more, but the the lesson here by taking that one hadith is to remind you to focus when you talk to a Wahhabi or anyone else. Don't bring out everything you have. Find the proof that you need, that one proof that you need, and you use it against your opponent. Now we're finished with the hadith. So how about statements of scholars? That's the next type of textual evidence. Well, we've already gone through several of them. We've quoted Ahmed, we've quoted Abu Hanifa, and we've quoted others. As if we didn't quote any of them, let's see what we have here. Question, what did the scholars say? Answer, after creating the creations, Allah did not acquire one of their attributes, like being in a physical direction in comparison to them nor did he lose any of his attributes, like eternally existing without changing. None of the creations became attributes of Allah. After creating places and directions, he did not take them as attributes for himself. He is not attributed with a created attribute, an attribute that did not exist and then came into existence. This is why al tahawi a true Salafi, meaning a scholar from the time of the Salaf, 
He said in his book, famous as the Aqidah of Al-Tahawi, Al-Aqidah Al-Tahawiyya, he said, مَا زَالَ بِصِفَاتِهِ قَدِيمًا قَبْلَ خَلْقِهِ with his attributes, he never ceased to be without a beginning before his creation. He did not acquire any attribute that did not exist before them, before the creations. He did not acquire any attribute that did not exist before the creations. وَكَمَا كَانَ بِصِفَاتِهِ أَزَلِيًّا And just as he, with his attributes, is without a beginning, كَذَلِكَ لَا يَزَالُ عَلَيْهَا أَبَدِيًّا Likewise, he, with his attributes, will always be everlasting. So how's that for a quote? That's a quote that a Wahhabi won't bring. At least not while understanding what he's talking about. Any questions so far? 